And this morning, we're starting a new series. Was, was Peacemakers not awesome? I, I mean, and not like hard to, like in your face. And I pray that we have seen some fruit and continue to see some fruit. It's not like, it's not like oh, good God, we did that Peacemaker thing. We got that taken care of. God, continue to work in us. May we be peacemakers. This morning, we're starting our sermon series, which is going to be Things Jesus Didn't Say. For this summer, we're going to be stoking in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the stories of Jesus. Uh, for this morning, if you have a Bible, you can pull it out. We're going to be in Luke 14, 25 to 27. And so throughout this summer, we're going to be looking at things Jesus didn't say to notice what he does say, what, what he does mean. Maybe taking many different places within the scriptures where we thought Jesus would go this way, but instead he went this way. Therefore, what does that mean about God and how does that relate to my life? So this morning, simply put, Paul's going to, have you handed those things out yet? No. Uh, he's drinking his coffee. I'm going to interrupt Paul with his coffee and he's going to pass out uh, some handouts that you can use this morning. I am going to some fill in the blanks. A number of people have told me they like these, and so we'll, at some, we'll keep doing them for a while. Jesus did not say it's going to be easy. Okay? Like, nowhere. He did not say it's going to be easy. And instead, as we're going to turn to Luke 14 this morning, in verse 25, let's look, let's look at what he did say. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, large crowds, a bunch of people, it, it, everyone's following him. He's getting a lot of momentum. He's building stuff. What's he gonna, he's gonna get this, he's gonna get a really large selfie stick and be like, all right, everyone get in here. King. Jesus, what are you gonna say? He's gonna stand up and say, yes, we have enough people now that we can go do great works and let's go into Jerusalem and take over. Jesus has gathered a big crowd. What's he gonna say? He's gonna say, go invite your friends and bring even more so we can be even more powerful. What are things, when someone has power and influence, we always over and over think that they love to leverage it, and we see people leveraging it for their own fame or for their agendas. Jesus has large crowds who started to follow him. He's going to turn to them and say something. What would we expect? Because Jesus didn't say it's going to be easy. Come here, follow me. Let's get some more. Let's build this thing even bigger. See, I wonder also, I need you guys to sit with me here. There's large crowds following Jesus. They've seen him speak and give words of life. And they say, man, when he speaks, he speaks with someone with authority. They, they, they have seen compassion out of Jesus and his heart for, for the hurting, his heart for the lost, his heart for the downtrodden. They have seen supernatural miracles. He heals the sick. And, and they're following. I wonder what they're, they're expecting. And so they're all following him. Jesus, what are you going to say now? You turn to us. We're all here. We're all gathered. There's so many of us. What are you going to say to us? Here's what he says, verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And say it's going to be easy. Let's start at the end. Disciple, that word disciple. It, depending on your translation uh, of the New Testament, of the Bible, that word disciple is used somewhere between 275 and 300 times 
in the New Testament. Do you know how many times the word Christian appears in the New Testament? Three. Six times uh, 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 the the believers, the disciples, were first called followers of the way. They're, They're referred to that six times in scriptures. So twice as many times as the word Christian, they were, they were referred to as followers of the way, but almost then 300 times disciples. What is a disciple? What is a disciple? A disciple, and here you can fill this in, is an authentic follower of Jesus. A disciple is an authentic follower of Jesus. It's a learner. It's someone who is learning from him, And write this on that bottom part, learning from him and becoming like him. In the Jewish culture of that time, a disciple is one who would follow their rabbi and learn from their rabbi and become like their rabbi. In the Jewish culture, they said they would get covered in the dust of the rabbi because they'd be so near him and following in his footsteps. A disciple is someone who is learning from Jesus, becoming like him. I don't know if I just read the Bible, it would seem like God's more interested in us, interested in us being disciples than Christians. And especially in a cultural crazy idea now of what is even Christianity and all of this, Jesus is saying, disciples, if you want to be my disciple, you know what you need to do? Hate your mother and father. All right, let's look into that. Let's deal with that for a minute. Guys, this is not literal. There's another place where Jesus says, you know, if, you're, if your right arm causes you to sin, cut it off. Or if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. These are not literal. He's making a point. Yeah, I know. So I was like, oh, go sell your chainsaw. Um, it, it's a figure of speech, right? I mean, he, it's hy- hyperbole. He, he, he's speaking excessive to make a point. What he is doing is that he's challenging the priority of our affections. A disciple is someone who's going to align their affections. What is it that you really worship? What is it that you really give your greatest affections to? What what is it that you really get your identity from? See, idols, the idea of idols, are spoken of often in the Bible. An idol, an idol could be this carved image that people actually put up and said, okay, this is our little idol, we worship you. But idols also are spoken of, these are the things that that we put highest in our life. And, And if it is not God, it is an idol, it is a lesser God. David Guzik, who is a man I really appreciate, a pastor, and has written commentaries on the scripture, he has this line, he says this, The greatest danger of idolatry comes not from what is bad, but from what is good, such as love in family relationships. The greatest threat to the best often comes from second best. Hear that? It's not that it's bad. It's good. It's really good. It's just not the greatest thing. And when the really good is put in the place of the greatest, it becomes an idol. And Jesus says, no, no, my my disciples, the authentic followers of me, don't do that in their life. And and so how do we we align our affections? God, that, that we would love the things that are good, but we would love even more the things that are greatest. We would give ourselves not to the lesser good, but the greater good that we need to identify our idols. Identify our idols. Hate your father and mother. Hate your spouse and your kids. Whoa, whoa, whoa. J- Jesus says, listen, God is calling for our utmost affection. Maybe for some of us, our kids have become an idol. Our spouse has become an idol. 
Say, God, I, I just want to please this person, or God, I want them to behave a certain way and become a certain thing. What are the idols? Some of us, it's achievement. God, I just want to achieve that. I want to do this. I want to have this certain respect that comes from achieving this goal. And so I will, you call me to certain things, but I will set them down because what is more important is my achievement. Some of us are recreation. And, and I know that's, it's a great thing. Some of us are so into our bodies and how our bodies look and identity we get from that. Some, some of us are so into like our leisure that, that even in the ways that it, that it takes such a priority in our life. And God may be calling us to some other things. So some of us, it's uh, our reputation. Some of us, it's our religious attitude and our self-righteousness, our work, a desire for power or comfort or control. So here, here's what I want to do. Because we, we, we show up here not just to hear a talky talk. We show up here to try and hear from God. And we show up here trying to learn and grow. And I know some of us here, you're like, Matt, I'm here just checking it out. And I don't even know if I believe yet. And so some of us show up for that. But I hope if you show up for that, you're expecting to learn some or to grow some. And not even to just hear a stimulating talk, but actually connect with God. And so I want to say this. I believe that the Spirit of God could speak right now and, and could maybe even help us identify an idol. God, what is it in my life that I get out of whack and, and that I've put to a higher place than what it really is? In fact, I put above you. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a minute, and we're just going to listen and pray. I, I, I left a space on that sheet of paper. Maybe you're going to write down, God, here's, God, what is the idol this morning that I give my affection to in a disproportionate or inappropriate way? Write it down. I have a total idol of productivity. I love to feel productive. I love to get stuff done. And if stuff doesn't get done, I feel not worthless, unproductive. And sometimes God says, what do you raise your hand about? What did you write down? Always wanting. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And my dad, generational sin's a real thing, people. <laughs> Always wanting to produce something. And sometimes God says, hey, it's one of the things he spoke to me up at this retreat. Stop trying to push it all the time. Sometimes you just have to let me work and be OK. You, you want to control it and make it yours and get her done. Trust me. Trust me. And so, Lord, I confess that idol, along with my dad. Let God crush it, friends. Let God crush it. Let him identify it in your life and let him crush it, replace it. Verse 27, Jesus, he never says it's going to be easy. And he goes on and he said, whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. 
is a disciple thing again. Authentic follower of Jesus, someone learning from him and becoming like him. Carry their cross. To, to this crowd right away, it's saying, okay, this, this tool which we associate with death, this execution tool, you're telling me to carry it. They, they, they'd seen those sentenced to death be strapped with the cross and walk to the cross and be crucified as criminals. This is before Jesus has done it. But he, he says you're going to have to carry your cross and you're going to bear the weight of an instrument that will kill you. What is he saying? He's saying crucify your self-worship. You're going to have to crucify your self-worship. Some of us, when we peel it back, the truth is we're just beautifully arrogant. We like love to be all about ourselves, And we, it might not even look like it, but we are all about ourself. And everything that comes at us, we put through put through the, the screen of, well, is this what I want? Is this what's good for me? Is this what I like? Will this benefit me? Is it good for me? And me, 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 I, I, I. Some of us actually have a reverse, and, and, and you have to crucify your self-loathing. Because some of us feel so unworthy or unlovable, that, that we we'll just always put ourselves down. And, and there's a deep insecurity there. And, and the truest thing about us is what God says about us. And you say, no. So it's weird. Some of us crucify our self-worship. Some of us, it's because we're so arrogant. And some of us, it's because we're so insecure. In Luke chapter 9, a couple chapters back, Jesus says a really similar thing, and I want to read it to you. We'll put it on the screen. Luke 9, 23 to 25, he says, Then he said to them, then Jesus said to them, and this is to like his small group of disciples. He spoke to the big crowd. And one thing I love, Jesus speaks to the, to the few and to the many in kind of the same way. And he said to them, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Take up your cross daily. God, what is it that you're working in me today? What is, it, what is that to which you call me today? Lord, help me not be so self-interested all the time. Lord, help me not listen to the lies that are whispered to me about about my unworthiness. Pick up your cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever's all about themselves will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their soul? Jesus says, if you really want to build your soul, if you really want that which satisfies, don't focus on yourself because that's a really small cause, actually. It's a really small way to live. Focus on me. Hear this. He doesn't say focus on a great cause. He doesn't say focus on a justice thing. He says focus on me. Sometimes that can be an idol, too. God, all the stuff we're going to do for you. No, focus on you. That's what puts everything in the right perspective. Too often we think that following, you know, just follow your heart, follow whatever you feel, and that will lead to this like satisfied life. That's not what scripture says. Just follow your heart and it'll lead to a, a satisfied life. Here's a really often misquoted or misinterpreted scripture. Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Oftentimes, I think we read that, and we're like, God, if we, just, if we just put you highest, then you'll give us everything we want. God, if we just lift you up some, then, then you're going to fulfill and give us everything we want. I don't think that's what this scripture means. You know what I think this scripture means? 
It says, delight yourself. God, if we put you at, at the top, if we start to recognize you for who you are and creator, who's given us everything around us and the breath we breathe and the days we have and the beauty of nature and, and the goodness of wealth and of work and of family and of all things. God, if we delight ourselves in you and we thank you for everything you've given us, you will give us desires in our heart that are different than our own sin-stained desires of our heart. You will actually give us those desires and we'll start to hunger and thirst for things that are true and right and holy and powerful and not about ourselves. So God, may we, may we learn to start to see you and ascribe worship to you and recognize you, God, for who you are, and then you'll start to shape the desires of our heart. Because sometimes we long for such little. We settle for, for, for such, such a pathetic excuse for actually what God has for us. And, and what it is to be a follower of Jesus and a disciple of Jesus. God, may we see you in such a way that you give us such a compassion for people. God, may we see you in such a way that you give us such a heart for our work and help connect our work to meaning and to ministry. God, that, that you would help us see our money and, and, and all of our stuff that we steward and then we say, okay, God, this isn't just mine, 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 more. God, we hold it and we have gratitude. And, and we say, Lord, what, 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 would, what are you calling us to do? And some of us would buy a really bigger house and fill it with a bunch of Eagle Lake people, you know? Or some of us would sell our house and do something different. I don't know. Lord, what we really want is you. Give us that. What your soul really needs is to be more impressed with God than we are with ourselves. Your soul longs for God, not yourself. Your soul longs for a bigger story. Say, okay, great, Matt, that's inspiring. How? How do I crucify my self-worship and my selfishness? How do I start to get this picture, a bigger and more compelling picture of who God is and who Jesus is that, that, that allows me to take steps of faith and be an authentic follower of Jesus, to be a more committed disciple and a learner, learning from him and becoming like him? How, how do we do that, Matt? I'll come back next week. We'll talk about that. Okay. You know what? I could, I could give you a lot of like self-help techniques here. But I don't think it would work. Friends, that we are saved by grace. A follower of Jesus, a disciple, is saved by grace, God's undeserved gift, and we grow in grace, understanding that which God gives us that we do not deserve. We, we'd love to say, okay, God, I'll do like this six things, and then, and then I'll arrive, and we'll get there. And there's definitely practices and disciplines and formation that happens in our life. You're never going to know God more if you never open up the Bible on your own and read it. Okay, you're, you're going to be like a really stunted growth. And it's not just that I read the Bible and checked it off, but like, God, give me the words of life and may I know you and give me a hunger for you. And, and that's just it. And that's why I can't say, hey, here's the three things you need to do to have a deeper hunger for God and then appropriate worship. Because this is what I'd say. You've got to respond and sense the Spirit of God who is real, and it's the role of the Holy Spirit who brings conviction and gives insight. Have you heard the Spirit of God speak to you? Have you given him room or space? Some of us need to say, God, make me hungry, because I'm not. 
Because I live in suburbia, America, and I'm rich, and really, I don't think I need you. Because I can, I can shoot par without you. Right? I mean, we live in a pretty sweet, swanky time in history. And we can be fat and rich, and our souls can be shriveled. And that we're so tickled that we don't even know our deepest needs. And so, Spirit of God, keep awakening us. Keep opening our eyes. Help convict us. Help give us a hunger for you. Help us not be satisfied with all the temporary things that we're thrown all the time. To be your disciple is to put you first and have you be our greatest affection. To be your disciple is to get over my self-worship and our selfishness. When Jesus responds to the crowd by raising the expectation of what it means to be a disciple, it causes me to evaluate my commitment and my maturity of faith. It does. And I'm challenged to develop a life more fully founded in him, aligning my affections and crucifying my selfishness. He didn't say it's going to be easy. So, so I'm kind of ending this morning, not with six steps to like spiritual maturity. I'm ending saying, God, give us a deeper hunger for you. And those things that do not satisfy God, make them not satisfy in us and help us to realize and recognize it. And the places where we put idols in our life, tear them down. So what we're going to do, we're going to finish our service. We got one more awesome worship song. But I'm going to ask, where's Tyler? Tyler's right here. Where's um, Dennis and Lorraine Pelly? Why don't, why don't you three stand up, you guys three? Um, Tyler's uh, youth pastor, Dennis and Lorraine, are like awesome bulwarks of this church and great people. They're going to go to the back, and I'm going to go to the back, and we're going to sing this last song. And if you guys have sensed, here's the deal. We don't show up, we show up here expecting God's going to work. And, and if you've sensed just something like, man, I'm not that hungry, or I've got this idol, or something's going on, or anything in your life, I want to just say this. Dennis and Lorraine are not, they're, they are awesome lovers of God. Tyler is an awesome lover of God. They're not like super special people, but guess what? The Bible does call us to pray for each other. And that they would love to pray. And I'm going to go back over here. And if you want prayer this morning, just come back there during the last song. It's not, let's, let's, it's not weird. Okay, let's get over that part. In fact, maybe some of you need to kill your idol of what will other people think of me. Get over it and go back and pray with somebody. St let's stand up. God, we gather as your church on a Sunday morning to lift you up, man, through worship, through communion, through the giving of our tithes and offerings and to opening the scriptures. Lord, we are the crowd, and you turn to us, and you speak right into us about our affections and our self-worship, and you remind us what we really long for is you. So, Lord, awaken us a deeper desire to know you, to see you, to walk with you. God, give us the lenses, the lenses by which to view all of the good things you have given around us, knowing that they are a gift from you and that you are the greatest. Cause us to hunger more. Give us a desperation as individuals and as a church, a desperation for you, God that you would form us, that we would learn from you and become more like you. Have your way with us, Lord. Thank you for this morning.
Some of you want to pray, you can come back here and pray. You can worship. For some of the new people, I look forward to connecting with you at Backstage Pastors after the service. Peace of Christ.